even that honorable lodge well his argument is that uh, having passed a good number of laws why would this one be the one to send them home would that be taking the sovereign right of the people um first of all my claim to fame is that Anthony Alwoch uh, Mweshimiwa was my student and the top student at that. You seem to have done uh, a good fact, job. He was the African champion in legal debate mm. and I was his team coach. So I'm immensely proud of him. So it's Please. interesting that uh, now I'm having to uh, debate with him. I think I should retire really now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Reti you should uh, retire or, or, or also time. prove, prove your, your <laughs> tutorship. <laughs> yes. Anyway, uh, first of all, uh, let me take the argument where he says he has uh, participated in passing 98%, 99% of the pieces of legislation. Mm. Remember today, if Moshimo Watch killed somebody, he's not going to argue to the police and said, sorry, actually, I followed the law 99% of the time. This was just one time that I actually committed a crime. Right. He'll still be considered a criminal. So you, it, that is not an argument at all. Um, let's look at when he says it's unfair on parliament. Remember, the, he has argued correctly so that it is the state and the, all the, ju the judiciary, the executive and parliament are all part of the state. Remember that uh, each part of the state has their role to play. So parliament, the role of legislation or enacting the legislation as put, as put on parliament in Article 261 is right because the judiciary cannot legislate. The executive cannot legislate. The head of state cannot legislate. And therefore, this is something that is squarely within, uh, within parliament's uh, docket. Mm. If uh, the judiciary fails uh, to, to hear cases, then of course, you can, actually, um, you, can, you can actually take action against them. If it is the state, there is also certain piece of action that you can take against them. So mm -hmm. this one is squarely at the docket of parliament mm -hmm. because only parliament can legislate. You can't blame any other part of the state for failure to do that. In fact, the court has done its part because the law says that if parliament fails to enact any of the 48 plus pieces of legislation, then someone can go to the high court for an order. Right. And when the high court gives the order, the, and the and the and the uh, and parliament fails to obey the order, then it shall be dissolved. The chief justice shall advise the president to dissolve. So each part of the state, as he describes it, have done their part. Mm. Uh, when he talks about um, dissolving parliament, will take away the sovereign, sovereign right, right of, of the, the people, people mm -hmm. that voted for him. Remember that we also the, the sovereign people exercise their sovereign right by uh, voting for the head of state, but to the same uh, constitution provides that if the con if the president is in gross violation of the constitution or any other law then parliament b b b upon attaining one uh, a third of the members signatures mm -hmm. then can move a motion for impeachment of the president mm. so is that taking away the sovereign right of the people the sovereign right of the people is that we have voted for you to go and do certain uh, tasks or work that we have appointed you to do. Mm. And if you don't serve us diligently, the same constitution gives us the power to send you home. All right. Today, mm -hmm. anyone can be impeached, even the president. So even there is the right to recall, which is in the constitution. Which is the right to exercising the right to recall, mm. which is provided in the constitution, is not taking away the sovereign right of the people. The sovereign right of the people is enshrined in the constitution. Mm. You are not elected to come and do what you want in parliament. You are elected to come and work for the people who elected you within the confines of the constitution. Hence the reason why before you start working, you take the oath of office. All right. And, and swear. And and, and Honorable Gladys well, Bosley, just yeah, just just to get where you are at exactly, do you feel that Parliament should be dissolved? In your own opinion, do you think that uh, Parliament should be dissolved? I, I don't have to think. It's not what I think or feel. It is what the Constitution, what the constitution demands. Says. All Which right. Constitution Kenyans voted for? Right. So already the will of the people is enshrined in that Constitution. All right. There is then the political argument, and that's why I'm asking you that question. There's a political argument of several things that we must consider, and I will quote what the former Prime Minister said. We've been ushered into circumstances that requires consensus, failing to which we may throw away the baby with the bathwater. There is the letter 
and the spirit of the Constitution. The letter of the Constitution by, I mean, we're not even arguing or uh, debating that because uh, Maraga has followed the law to the letter. But there is the spirit. COVID-19 has come. Uh, we have another maybe two years before the elections. Do you feel that that would be reasonable for us to dissolve parliament right now? That is not the spirit. What the circumstances you have described are the circumstances prevailing within the country. That is not the spirit of the Constitution. The spirit of the Constitution is what the Constitution dictates. So those external circumstances outside the Constitution are not So the given spirit. the circumstances, do you still hold the opinion that Parliament should be dissolved? Yes, I do. That is the, that is the law. Unless they enact the legislation as required by the Constitution. And that's why I have recently said that there is a leeway for the head of state. If he actually, as head of state, he knows that we have COVID, we have economic hard times, IBC is not properly constitution, constituted, we don't have a budget for it. Knowing all that is happening, then he must tell himself, what do I do to resolve the problem? Mm -hmm. He has a leeway because the law does not give him a time frame within which he should dissolve parliament. Although the law implies it is immediate or within reasonable time. Okay. But he can use that leeway to call the party leaders, to, to call his, um, the, uh, his attorney general, mm -hmm. to call the speakers of the house, sit down and try and make sure that that legislation is enacted within the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. In which case, the, 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 the mischief that uh, dissolution was, uh, of parliament was going to cure will will have been resolved and therefore there'll be no need because remember dissolution is not for the sake of it dissolution is because of the failure to enact the legislation All so right. there is a window so this is the time that we expect uh, that the the leadership of this country takes this and tries to resolve it and to, if okay. they are irresponsible and mm -hmm. decide not to dissolve it then we go to we'll, we'll dissolve and we and we have no choice that is why we have a contingency fund contingency fund is uh, supposed to for certain emergencies when, right. when they do come in. Okay. And the only time you can suspend the constitution mm -hmm. is if we have a state of emergency. All right. And the rest uh, of the time, let, let, the constitution can never be suspended. Okay, let me hear from Honorable Luoch, and uh, there is leeway for the president, and that is expected. Oh, by the hopefully. way, Michael, let me just. Michael, let me just correct this. That solution I'm suggesting is a, is a technical and pragmatic one. It's not a, it's not a legal one. It's not a legal one. <laughs> and, and, and I yeah. guess political to some extent. Honorable Oluoch, your thoughts on this and maybe whether the president ought to utilize that because at the end of the day, there is a mischief that is trying to be resolved. And even uh, the former prime minister mentions and says, even if parliament is dissolved, will not necessarily have solved the mischief that is trying to be resolved. Uh, yes, it is um, a mystery that you have to resolve uh, jointly, but before I come to what the leeway the president has, allow me to talk about the spirit of the constitution and let's raise the argument there, because uh, a lot of people will argue that the chief justice has uh, done his duty in accordance with the law, the president just uh, act as a robot and send us home. What was the spirit of the constitution? And I want to take us to the spirit of this. Um, there are two competing principles here in the Constitution, and one was the first past the goalpost, uh, which is an, a principle uh, anchored under Article 38 of the Constitution, universal suffrage, the free expression of the will of the people. First past the goalpost takes the, the, the lead. And then there is the universal suffrage principle, and now you balance that against the affirmative action uh, principle. When you have two competing principles under the Constitution, and if I was to weight this, the, the, the right to vote and the right to choose a person of my choice is clearly anchored and weighted as against an affirmative action principle, which in my view is an aspiration. And I think the Supreme Court advisory said as much that this is an aspiration. So where there is a clear, clear provision of the Constitution that accords a right and then you have to balance it with an aspiration clearly that is something that we have to resolve in terms of a constitutional tension that results uh, from there and which is the way out we were just about to get into the bbi debate what was the rush for the chief justice when he has had all these uh, high court decisions from 2015 2016 2017 2018 100 days to his retirement and some people have said that he has five 
months of uh, leave. So what is uh, the, the, the people who are uh, half in jest ask the question that does he even have the, 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 the legal status or the legal grounding to be able to make that advisory? But that's really said in jest. Under Article 261, massively, the president does not have to act on this within any time frame. And it says, once the Chief Justice had, has already advised, the president shall dissolve. It does not say when he can dissolve. And because this matter presents itself now within certain circumstances, you, you, you have considered the spirit, you have considered the rights, you have weighted it with the aspirations, and you have looked at the circumstances. If I was the president, looking at all this collectively <clears throat> and without wanting to breach the Constitution, I would wait out and without breaching the constitution, allow parliament to, one, receive the article 100 from the Senate. Because if you look at the constitution, Michael, in respect of all these, including article 81, uh, the only place that it clearly says there is a direct obligation on, uh, on, on parliament to pass mm. the legislation is article 100. And it says that parliament shall pass legislation to promote uh, the special representation in parliament. Right. We have passed as the National Assembly that bill. We are awaiting for the, 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 the counterpart in Senate to be able to deal with it and bring it to us. Mm. As a way forward, if I was the president, I would wait to see if there is compliance to that. Number two, I would wait to see what the BBI does. Number three, we have a, 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 an option in parliament that this has been suggested and God forbid that we have to do this, to raise two thirds so that we can be able and delete Article 81B altogether, so that we wait for uh, the sovereign, because there is this conflict on how we can implement, let's take this back to the sovereign under Article 1 of the Constitution mm. and ask, we have tried for 10 years to implement this principle, please give us directions again. Mm. But before we do that, we have those options, Article 100 can come back from the Senate, the President can wait for BBI, and Parliament can go back and, and, and delete all right. or amend altogether at the okay, we, we, um, 81B. Yes, sir, uh, Honorable Shale. Okay, first of all, BBI is nowhere in the Constitution. There is, no, there is nowhere that a process called BBI is anchored in any law in Kenya for the change of the Constitution or to resolve any of our uh, constitutional or legal issues in Kenya. It is not provided for. So let's stop talking about BBI. It is not legally provided for. What uh, uh, Honorable Alwatch is arguing, a good argument, but none of those arguments have a legal basis at all. When you say that, it, that uh, civil, you know very well that civil and political rights are realizable immediately. It is only social, economic, and cultural rights that are realizable progressively. This is a human rights issue. It is therefore realizable immediately. immediately. It's a civil and political right. Mm. But then also, um, when you talk about um, that uh, parliament needs to garner two thirds in order to delete that two thirds uh, uh, section in the constitution, remember, this is not, that's what I'm saying, you're interpreting it as a women's issue. It's about the right to equality. Yes, mm -hmm. and Kenya also has Kenya has signed international conventions, and I've listed them. Kenya has signed the United, United Nations, the Convention on Civil and Political Rights, the International Convention on uh, Cultural and Economic uh, and Social Rights. Kenya has signed uh, the, the AU protocol and so on. And upon signing that, Article 2 of our Constitution says that any international treaty that Kenya signs and ratifies becomes part of the Kenyan constitution and law. That mm -hmm. is what Article 2 says. So even if you, you delete it from the constitution, then you will have to go back and go back on the international conventions you've signed. Mm -hmm. Because that is why we went to ICC in the first place. Because Kenya, ICC was not provided for in our constitution, but, or in our legislation per se, but the, we, ha we were signatory to the Rome Statute. Right. And that is why the head of state and the deputy president had to heed to the summons and appear before the ICC, because mm. then they would have been disobeying a legitimate court order that is recognized by our constitution. 
Uh, to remove the two-thirds principle, you'd have to be removing the right to equality and the, and the right not to be discriminated upon on account of your gender mm. uh, uh, and, and, and so on, which means you re that it touches on the Bill of Rights, which means we'll have to go to a referendum. It is or not something that can be done in Parliament. Okay, so, so in your opinion, Honorable Cholet, you don't see building bridges, the Building Bridges Initiative, as a possible solution for this. It may not be in the Constitution, but there has been the push for it. And uh, evidently, the fact that we're here means we need to discuss the Constitution and amend if need be. Uh, you see, the, bu the Building Bridges Initiative is a pedestrian process that was started to just speak to Kenyans. But it is not, they will have to convert it into a legal it has process. no legal under framework. The mm -hmm. Yes, they would have to pro put it under pro legal process. Mm -hmm. And in any case, recently I've been hearing everyone talking about the BBI, the BBI. I have not received the BBI2 report. It has not been given to Kenyans. No one knows about it. It seems that Anthony Alwatch knows about it. I've had Otwali talking about it. I've had Murade talking about it. I've had Raila talking about it. So it seems to this document that they frighten us with. So can they bring it? Let's see what that document is. Don't talk to us about a document that Kenyans haven't read and has not been published and disseminated to the people of Kenya. All right. It is oh. not a, the private property of oh. a few. Hmm. It is their, their, their hidden weapon that they want to use. They keep telling us about it. Have you read it, Michael? No, Have you well, read it? The, the, the second Have you seen one, the no. report they're talking about? Mm -hmm. All right, no, not yet, but Honorable Loach, would you yes. like to respond to that? And have, you, have, you, have you been privy to the BBI2 report, which is uh, what uh, Honorable Chalet says keeps being... I'll have a sideline with him so that he can give me that report. I think he has it. Honorable Loach. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. First of all, as to whether BBI is a pedestrian process, my answer is uh, no. If you read uh, Article 257 of the Constitution, it clearly sets out a process leading to the publication of a bill, and that process is where we are. So it's perfectly legal and anchored. I believe that um, uh, my teacher's um, boss, the deputy president, was at BOMAS, and collectively, as the presidency received the, the views which were to lead to this process. So it is, I, I doubt really that the presidency and the deputy would participate in a pedestrian pro, uh, a pro process. Mm -hmm. It was gazetted by an executive order so that the BBI as a team, you may agree or not agree with their composition or where they are going, uh, so to speak, politically, if you will, but they are anchored under the law. That's uh, number one. Number two is that um, if we delete... Part of the law? Of, Which part of the law? Sorry, it's part of the process of lawmaking. And you no, no, just tell me the, the process. Just quote uh, the I can tell you that. I can tell you that uh, Article 257 of the Constitution contemplates that before you bring a draft bill, you have collected views and signatures so that you are in that incubation stage of preparing a bill. The same way we are in an incubation stage of preparing a bill when we go to public participation, and at, under Article 118, it is contemplated under the law. It is properly. But normally, under. when you go to public participation, you will have it is the the bill will have been published. It's normally published, true. then it goes to the committee stage, and then it goes to uh, a public participation. That's the process. Then that goes is to true. proceeding and that so is on. True. That is true. That is true. That is true. Then you, you, you look at the international... So it has not been published. Uh, I don't remember any bill under BBI being published. I just remember it people it being appointed. Published. Gladys, people being it isn't published. It isn't published, Gladys, but there is a process that is contemplated under the Constitution leading to the publication. Number two... I want to answer to the question whether the two-thirds gender principle, if you remove the uh, provisions in the Constitution, is anchored under international instruments. What is anchored under the international instruments is what is in Article 27, 1 up to, uh, let me believe, 4, the non-discrimination principle. The two-thirds gender rule is unique to Kenya alone. There is no precedent or legislative framework anywhere in the world that brings two-thirds gender rule. Uh, uh, much less the international uh, in, in instruments. Mm. The, the, the last thing, and I hope, Michael, at some point we will engage into this, uh, because uh, we have now had the opportunity. If we go back to Article 27, especially Part uh, 27.8, it talks about legislative and other measures to ensure the affirmative action in respect of both elective and appointive. 
So even as we engage on the debate as to whether parliament has failed or not, the focus has been too much, in my view, on representation of elective people to parliament as opposed to the collectivity of the state. And, 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 and this includes cabinet, it includes the judiciary, and it includes constitutional commissions, none of which observe the two-thirds gender rule. And under Article 27, it is contemplated that this principle is supposed to apply for both appointive and non-appointed positions. All right. I hope that as a country we can engage in that debate. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. I'll need your closing remarks. I'll start with you, Honorable Cholet. Uh, maybe very briefly responding to what Aloch has said, but also include your closing remarks. Uh, I think we should quit the blame game. You can't say, oh, because the, ju the, ju the Supreme Court doesn't have the, doesn't meet the two-thirds gender principle, then we as parliament can do it. No. Remember, the, during the court process, when, because remember this matter was not decided by Maraga, it was decided by the High Court. When the High Court was making its order, Parliament was represented, and Parliament made those same arguments that uh, Honorable Olwatch is making. And the judge, considering all the, the, the factors and all the arguments before them, made that decision. So that argument has already been resolved by the, was not bought by the High Court. And therefore, we cannot start litigating outside the court. The court order has been made. We are not a banana republic. We believe in the rule of law, and therefore, we must obey the court order. All so right. let's quit the game and let's find a solution. All right. Uh, Honorable Loach, your closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Where well, we have competing uh, uh, philosophical uh, principles under the Constitution, the best way to do them is usually to go back to the people and ask the people to resolve this. We have been confronted in the gender debates with two competing principles. That is the first uh, past the goalpost, the universal prince, uh, suffrage principle of uh, the ability to vote or for a person of your choice without let or hindrance. Mm. And, and so in the circumstances in which we are, and taking into account uh, what I have said that uh, the, the, the universal, I mean, the gender principle is a, a, a something that ought to be achieved by the state in their collectivity. I think that it would be a good point for us to pause here and say that we will need parliament in order to be able to put in place a framework where the people can be able to debate this question on how we can realize it properly. We need to go back then to a situation where we are looking at a framework of the BBI coming to parliament we need to be able to, to, to fund uh, any consequential, either general election or, 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 or a BBI referendum. We need parliament to be in place to do a number of things. Mm -hmm. To be able to say, let us throw parliament simply because it has that tried but failed to achieve something, in my view, would be create, trying to resolve a problem in the words of uh, Amos Kimonya, the majority leader, by creating a worse problem. Mm -hmm. The solution to a problem cannot be more painful uh, than the problem itself. All right, thank, thank you. Michael, allow Very... me to just correct that. The law doesn't say parliament should try. It says it should enact. So you don't get bonga points for trying. Try. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are out of time. And uh, obviously, this requires a lot more debate. And I'm sure we'll continue with the discourse.